Perfect. Right. Thank you so much. Well, for those of you, there's a lot of uh, new names on here. I think that Elise shared this widely. So thanks for doing that. And for those of you who are not familiar with Omega Phi Alpha, I just wanted to give a brief overview. My name is Alyssa Bernhardt, and I'm currently the interim executive director of Omega Phi Alpha National Service Sorority. We are a service organization. We have a um, diverse service program where we ask our members to complete a minimum number of service hours in six different areas of service. And one of those areas of service is mental health. And in the spirit of it being a mental health awareness month, we reached out to some of our members who we thought might be interested in giving a presentation on some subject of mental health or um, mental illness. And one of our lovely national team members um, is a sister of Omega chapter where she met Elise and recommended Elise to give a presentation tonight. And I'm so excited. I met with Elise to talk about the um, possibility of giving this presentation and learn so much about her. So I'm so excited that you're here. Um, she is going to share about her experience living with obsessive compulsive disorder and is going to explain the differences between the reality of OCD and what we often learn or that we think OCD is based on, you know, what people out in the world say. So she's going to explain a little bit about her journey with mental health advocacy and how it all led to the creation of her small business dedicated to OCD awareness. I hope you're going to plug your small business at some point in this presentation because it's awesome. And so after this presentation, everyone who's attending should really learn a little bit more about OCD as a whole and just how it has shaped Elisa's path. So if you guys have any questions about Omega Phi Alpha, those of you who are not familiar, you can learn more about us at omegaphialpha.org. And I'm sure Elise will share how to contact her at the end. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Alyssa. Hi, so my name is Elise Petronzio, and like Alyssa said, I'm an alumna of the Omega chapter of Omega Phi Alpha, uh, which national service sorority that I was in in college. I graduated a couple years ago from Rutgers University in New Jersey, and I, one reason I was drawn to Omega Phi Alpha was because their permanent project is mental health, and mental health is very important to me because I've lived with obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, since I was at least six, and we'll get into more of the details of that. But I did want to start the presentation. Hold on one second, I'll pull up my PowerPoint. I did want to start it by talking about what people think OCD is, like when they hear the word OCD, what comes to their mind. So what we're going to do, if you could take out your phone and I can post a link in the chat. Still trying to navigate this here, the toolbar thing is in the way, okay. All right, show responses. Okay, hold on one second. I'll put the link in the chat for everyone. All right, hold on one second. All right. Ooh. All right, so you can go to that link if you want to write something from your computer. So just like a word or two or three about what you think of when you hear OCD and you're also able to text in your answers and you're able to text in your answers. You text, I wish I could have made this a shorter word, but I could not. It's, you text Elise the Octo 145. Two 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 three three three. So we'll give everyone a second, and it's anonymous. It shouldn't ask you for your name or anything. So feel free to just let us know what you think of when you hear OCD. We've got counting, cleaning. All right. 
All right, we got one now. Particular, tidy, ooh, so many, so many words. Oh boy, okay. We've got, we'll give it a second so that it stops turning over and over, but definitely you can see that cleaning is what people think of the most. Um, and we will talk about that because for some people that is part of OCD, but not everybody, which is what's really detrimental to when people are trying to figure out if they have OCD and if they need treatment is that they think they have to be, they think that they have to have problems with cleaning, but they really don't. There could be many other things going on. All right, so let's see, the words seem to have stopped moving for now. Someone said myself, sounds like we have other audience members with OCD here. So I feel you on that. Uh, anxiety. So it is interesting. We have some people who also have lived experience who can also speak to that if they want to at the end of the presentation. We have obsessed, guide, harmful, people, particular, obsessive, thought, tidy, fears, compulsions, misinformed, counting, learning, neat, and cleaning is a big one. Opportunity. I love to hear some of the explanations behind these words. I think it would be an interesting conversation. Perfectionist, that's definitely one too. So we do have definitely an audience that has some knowledge of what OCD is really like already, which is great. Um, and I thank you for being here too. I'm sure that a lot of you came from my social media channels. But like you can see, cleaning is obviously the biggest word. And most people, when they think of OCD, they think that it's all about cleaning. And that's what a lot of the jokes about OCD are. So hold on one second, we'll get back. All right. Okay, so some facts and figures about OCD. So first of all, we're gonna watch this quick video about what is OCD. And so this website is the International OCD Foundation, which is a really great resource if you're trying to learn about OCD, find treatment, things like that. And I feel like it even says a lot that a lot of people don't know that the International OCD Foundation exists. I didn't know it existed until I was 21 and I had OCD since I was at least six. So there is a really big gap in even just getting the knowledge out about what resources are there because there are a lot of resources. Tell me if you're going to be able to hear this. OCD stands for obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is a psychological condition that involves primarily two kinds of symptoms. You have obsessions and these are unwanted thoughts or ideas or images person doesn't want to have them, they can't stop them from coming to mind, and they create a lot of anxiety and distress and uncertainty for the person. And then compulsions are the things that the person does to try to get rid of the obsessional thought or the associated anxiety. And sometimes these behaviors take on a ritualistic or compulsive quality. Okay. All right. So the main thing that people don't understand about OCD to begin with is that it's not enjoyable. So a lot of people, when they talk about OCD, they talk about how they love to clean or how they love to keep things organized or color coded. And they're talking about something that they enjoy. And there's nothing enjoy enjoyable about OCD. It's a mental illness. Most, I don't know any illnesses that are particularly enjoyable. So that is one thing, if you walk away with anything tonight, just remember that OCD is not an enjoyable experience for the people that suffer from it. So some things about OCD. So a big thing about OCD that people don't understand because no one ever takes the time to tell you we don't learn about mental health in health class the way we learn about physical health. Um, OCD has a lot of different subtypes. So these are the types of things that people worry about. And for example, let me pull back up this site actually, because they have a lot of really great examples. So this is a whole list of different common things that people obsess about. And then also people can obsess about things that aren't on this list. So you can see contamination here, 
that is what people think of when they're talking about OCD. Those are like someone might clean a lot because they're really uncomfortable with feeling dirty. But again, that's only one group of people that have OCD. I actually read only like one in six people with OCD have contamination OCD and many people are worried about other things. So another example would be losing control. Uh, you might be worried that you're gonna do something that you randomly one day will not be able to control yourself doing something else. Like someone might be worried that they're gonna jump out of a car while it's moving. Uh, we all have intrusive thoughts like that but people with OCD get stuck on them and they have a lot more trouble. They want to be 100% sure that they're not gonna do it, but really you're never sure that you're not gonna do that. And people without OCD are able to move on while people with OCD get really hung up on it and really anxious. And then they do things to try to regain some control, which is where the compulsions come in. So some other things people are afraid of are harming other people, um, a lot of my friends with OCD are worried that they run somebody over. Like if they hit a bump in the road, they'll worry it was a person. And even though they know logically that it probably was not a person, they can't tolerate how uncomfortable they feel and they need to turn around and check. And so that's another group, perfectionism about things need to be in a particular way or else they feel off, which is a feeling that people don't want to sit with. Um, a really common one is unwanted sexual thoughts. Uh, religious obsessions is also very popular. Um, so people who are worried about going to hell, I uh, can make it very difficult to be engaged in religion. Um, people may think about things like, sometimes people worry that their sexual orientation is different than what it actually is. And that can make it very hard to stay in relationships. So as you can see, OCD actually touches a lot of different parts of people's lives, but we tend to only hear about contamination and we tend to only hear about it in like a positive way, which isn't really true. And that does lead to the fact that it takes usually an average of 14 to 17 years to get diagnosed if you're an adult and you start having OCD symptoms because people don't know that what they have is a curable, or not curable, it's a treatable, mental illness. So instead of coming forward about what's bothering them, they don't tell anybody because they think that if they're not obsessed with cleaning, they don't have OCD, they must just be losing their mind. And so OCD affects one in 100 adults, uh, one in 200 children and teens. And I just explained why it takes so long for people to get treatment. Luckily for children, it is quicker and that time frame is shrinking because people are talking about mental health so much more, which is really great. All right, so then my life with OCD. So I am one of those people that was one in the 200 children. Um, I had a childhood onset of OCD. The first time that I was noted, like someone noticed that I was doing compulsive things was when I was in first grade, my parents went to their parent teacher conference and my teacher was like, Elise is a really great student, but she's always coming up to me and asking if she has a fever every single day. And so my teacher would feel my head and tell me I was fine and tell me to sit down. But what was actually happening was that I was obsessing about if I was sick because I felt like I couldn't handle being sick. And I would ask her to reassure me that I wasn't sick. And that was very, that's very problematic. It actually makes OCD worse when you give in to whatever it's telling you to do. It gradually gets worse, which is what happened. Um, it's so I was six when they first noticed that, but my parents thought that it was just like a quirk. There wasn't a lot of information about OCD out back then either. That would have been back in like the early 2000s. Um, and by the time I was 10, it became really debilitating. I started to regress. I started to not be able to do things I could do before. Um, I was afraid to be away from my parents. And also I think some part of that is because of something called PANS PANDAS, which is Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. So basically some people with OCD, it can come from their body attacking their brain in an autoimmune attack. Um, sometimes it happens when people have strep, a lot of kids get strep, but your body like messes up and starts attacking your brain and it can cause a sudden onset of OCD symptoms. And I think that is what happened to me, but 
back then that research was like coming out the exact same time as I was going through it. So there was no way that they were going to catch it. But um, I was very lucky that my mom did put me in therapy when I was young. So they caught it really early. Other people's parents may have waited because they would have thought that it was just more quirks or that they could, that their child could think their way out of what was going on, but I definitely could not. Okay, and then, so I did, OCD is a chronic illness. Um, it tends to come back in episodes for a lot of people. Um, it also changes content. So like I did talk about subtypes before, um, sometimes people will have one subtype and then they kind of get over it, but then a different subtype pops up. But at the, at the foundation, it's really all about not being able to tolerate uncertainty. That's what OCD really latches onto. It wants to be sure that you didn't run someone over, that you're, you don't have germs on you that are gonna get you sick, that you didn't hurt somebody else, different things like that. And I said that OCD is the gift that keeps on giving because it kept changing themes and that is what happened for me. So when I was a teenager, um, I started having intrusive thoughts. So a lot of people with OCD may have disturbing intrusive thoughts. So they're thoughts that they don't want to have, but pop into their heads. And like I said, everyone has thoughts like this, but with OCD, people get stuck on it. Um, and that is what happened to me. And I, the things I was having thoughts about, I didn't want to tell people. I it didn't even want to tell my therapist. And I was in therapy, but I wasn't diagnosed with OCD. So I didn't think that, I didn't know that other people thought these things and had trouble with them. So that is, that is the main reason why I advocate now too, is because I wish someone had come to me when I was a teenager and told me that what I was dealing with was something other people dealt with and it was treatable because you really think you're the only one because you don't feel like you can talk about what's actually going on. And that is the shame and secrecy piece. And I did actually throw in the photo of me on the right at college. Um, I actually had just asked my dad if I could withdraw right before he took this picture because I was struggling so much with my OCD and he didn't want me to drop out. So he did leave me at college to continue. And luckily that did work out for me because getting back into a routine has always been helpful for my OCD. But that's not always the best way to go about things, but I just wanted to throw that in as an example of like on social media, someone might look like they're doing really well. I just moved in for my next year at Rutgers, but really I, did, I wanted to be anywhere else. OCD is completely invisible. There's really no way to know unless someone is telling you about it. And then let's see. All right, and then, so the last part, because I didn't want to end on a negative note about my life, is that also OCD does have a lot of treatment options available. OCD therapy is all about learning to face your fears in a way that you can handle. You teach yourself that you can handle distress. Many people also take medication, but through being able to challenge myself over and over as the different episodes would happen, I was able to teach abroad in Spain. I was able to graduate from college. I did a service trip in Guatemala. I obviously joined OPA, Omega Phi Alpha, if I'm giving this presentation. So different things like that. Um, and there are resources that we'll talk about at the end too. All right, let's see. And then, so my advocacy. So then I suffered I still suffer from OCD, but I had OCD without advocating for a really long time. And then I went to college and I was at the college involvement fair and I saw a table for a club to write love on her arms, which was all about mental health advocacy. So then I got involved with them and then I started working for NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness in their New Jersey office. And while I was working there, I got diagnosed with OCD. And I advocate because it adds a lot, it adds meaning to the suffering that I already have to experience. Um, I've also made a lot of really good friends doing my advocacy. You just connect with people on a really deep level and I don't want other people to suffer as long as I did just because there isn't information out about mental illnesses. Like 
if you're going to suffer from something, it shouldn't be because people are afraid to talk about it. If there's like nothing that can be done, that's one thing. But just because people don't talk about OCD, that's not in my mind, a good enough reason for people to suffer for 10 years the way I did. I didn't know anyone else with OCD for 10 years. And I didn't know I had it until I was 20. I got diagnosed when I was in college. So I just, everyone has their cause, I feel like, and this is my cause. And I care a lot about it. It's obviously affected my life very significantly. And then, so my biggest advocacy project is my business. So I started a small business called The Octopus, which is all about um, promoting different concepts of OCD recovery and putting them on things. For example, uh, there's this necklace right here on the front page about embracing uncertainty. So that is all about OCD treatment. That's what they try to teach you to do. So I do have this business and we have different products also that advocate for OCD. This is a teal bracelet. Teal is the OCD awareness color. And you can learn a lot about OCD just from looking on the website. But yeah, and then this is our Instagram. But the business has been very rewarding. I definitely never expected to own a business, which has been very interesting. But I just feel like a lot of people run Instagram accounts that advocate, and those are extremely important, but I didn't want to do what everyone else was already doing. And I'm not a therapist or trained as a therapist in any way. So I didn't really want to give advice over the internet. Um, so I do, I really like to make the merch because it's a great way to spread OCD therapy concepts, which people don't really know about. I think with the last year with the pandemic, we've all had to learn more about how to embrace uncertainty in order to get through our day-to-day -day lives. And this is something that people with OCD have had to manage for way longer than just the pandemic. And I also love the shop because it's a great way to build a community for people with OCD. It can be a very isolating disorder still. There's still a lot of stigma around it. And I just love how the community can rally around the products. Um, I love seeing everyone's pictures in them. And it's just like validating to have things that you can hold in your hand that relate to your experience. And they're also great daily reminders of what you're trying to remember to do when you're not in therapy. And they're also great ways to start conversations about what OCD is really like. For example, we have a lot of different jewelry. So you may have a bracelet that says embrace uncertainty. Someone without OCD might ask you what the bracelet says and you that's an opportunity to tell them if you're comfortable about why you're wearing that bracelet. And then, so I did want to do again, the activity from the beginning where I ask you what you think of when you hear OCD. So hold on one second, I can clear the responses from last time and you can use the same link and type in. Okay, there we go. So we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. All right, intrusive thoughts is a big one. I'm glad everyone will walk away knowing what intrusive thoughts are. It's important though, that even it's important for everybody to know because you're not your thoughts. And when you start to believe that you are what you think, it can really limit you whether you have OCD or not. So I'm glad everyone's walking away with knowing what intrusive thoughts were because I didn't know what they were until I was 16. So, and I could have really used that a lot earlier. Um, Okay, let's see. All right, so we have uncertainty, hope, perfectionism, hard. I also realize that it splits words, like it's probably intrusive thoughts, not thoughts intrusive. So I may not be getting the full picture of everything, but we have fear, 
cleaning anxiety taboo and diagnose. I think all of these are true still. A lot of what we said in the beginning is true too, but I am glad that people are hearing that it's not just about cleaning because when people make jokes about being OCD, they'll think about some of the stuff that we talked about tonight and intrusive thoughts, for example, would be one of those things. All right, let's see. And then, oops, that's not what we want. And then this part. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, and also, if anyone wants to stay connected, you can follow me and my business, The Octopus, on Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook, and the handle is up there. And also, I wanted to give some resources because I know it is kind of a heavy conversation. And in case someone watching this might have realized that they actually have symptoms of OCD and didn't think they did before, um, I would recommend going to the International OCD Foundation, iocdf.org. Um, OCD Game Changers is another nonprofit with different resources. And then NoCD, uh, also known as Treat My OCD, they're at treatmyocd.com. They're a great resource for getting therapy for OCD in the US, the UK, or Australia. So if you're looking for treatment, I would recommend any of those things. All right, let's see. I haven't looked at the Zoom in a while because I've been doing the screen share. Okay. All right. How could we do the questions? They're not able to write in the chat. Yeah, you guys should be able to write in the chat. It'll okay. just come to it'll just come to you. So everyone won't see. So you'll just have to like make us all aware of whatever the question might be. Gotcha. Yeah, that sounds good. Also, it was not enjoyable in the word cloud. I feel better about that. It's like, it's not enjoyable. All right, yeah, not enjoyable. All right, let's see. I do have a question. How did you approach your treatment differently during quarantine? Um, so honestly, during quarantine, I had more time to go to treatment because I wasn't, I used to commute an hour and a half each way to my job full time. So they didn't really leave me a lot of outside time to work on my mental health. Um, and I did actually go through no CD myself and it's a telehealth platform. So all of their services are online. Um, and it really just gave me more time to focus on that, which has been really nice. Anyone else have any questions? Also, I'll put my handle here because that was on the PowerPoint. I see some people from my chapter are here. Hello. <laughs> I appreciate the support. It's a quiet crowd. I'm not seeing any other questions. I have a couple questions, if it's yeah, okay sure. that I just ask them. Um, are there other, I know you gave like a couple of resources, um, you know, that people can go to that are organizations. I'm wondering if they're, like, if someone thinks that they, you know, recognize symptoms of OCD based on the information that you gave tonight, obviously, um, you know, you've given a couple of resources, but a conversation that has come up in other mental well-being events is like finding a therapist that you know, you think will address your specific needs. So I'm wondering if someone suspects that they may have OCD, what they should look for when they're looking for um, a professional. This is a really great point actually for people with OCD because a lot of therapists are not trained to treat OCD specifically and that can cause trouble for people because talking about what you obsess about can actually make it worse. So people with OCD are usually recommended to work with a specialist. So you could either go to treatmyocd.com. I believe it's .com, it might be .org, but that's no CD and those are all OCD specialists. And you wanna look for people who, hold on one second, okay. You wanna look for people who practice, therapists that practice ERP, which is 
the gold standard for OCD treatment. It's exposure response prevention rather than just talking. So even if you don't know what any of that means, just looking for the letters ERP or the word exposure when you are looking for a provider is really important with OCD. And IOCDF.org, they have a whole directory where you can search by where you are. Um, and they'll pull up specialists in the area who have been usually trained by them. Yeah, but that's a good point because you don't, it's not usually recommended to just go to anybody. All right, let's see. We have another question from the audience too. All right, what are some of your coping mechanisms? All right, let's see. <laughs> um, I definitely like to journal. I find that that's a good way to get out what I'm thinking about and just identify it as a thought like somewhere outside of my head because sometimes things make sense in my head but they don't make sense out loud. Um, a lot of times people with OCD, they realize more that their obsessions aren't as logical when they're talking about them to somebody else but the problem is that many people don't get to that point where they can talk about it with somebody else. So that's definitely a coping mechanism. Um, I do go to therapy still, which is important. Um, one thing I do a lot is also it's called a body scan. So it's just like paying attention to what's happening in your body. So it's like a meditation, really. Um, I do use a meditation app that's free called Insight. Ooh, I just sent that to the person only called <laughs> Insight Timer. And that's free meditation. So I'll type in like, stress and it'll pull up all these different meditations that you can do and it again it's free so i do like recommending that to people um also going out and continuing to socialize and engage with others is important especially now as things are getting calmer with the pandemic if you're able to do that that is very important and i think all of those things together and basic stuff like getting the right amount of sleep eating well drinking a lot of water, things like that. So I can set myself up with a strong foundation for whatever life throws at me after that. All right. Alyssa, did you have any other questions? Oh, I have another question. Okay, now, okay, there we go. How do you explain the OCD experience to your loved ones? This is a really good question, actually. Um, and it is something I actually have a lot of trouble doing. So I don't want to lie and say that I like have the perfect solution to that. Um, one thing that I think is always helpful is like the video I showed you, which was on IOCDF.org. I'm um, showing people materials about OCD is always a helpful way to describe it to them. There's also like so many people putting things out on social media now, um, making TikToks about what it's like to have OCD. Um, there's a documentary out by Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. Yeah, they have a documentary out. And then there's more documentaries coming out that I know about. So I would recommend using outside sources to show them because if you have any like chance of them not taking you seriously than like showing them that objectively that like other people have this experience too I think will be helpful yeah that would be my recommendation for that and also um a lot of different conferences and things have like support groups and stuff for families honestly even on the IOCDF website you can look up support groups for family members of people with OCD and that'd be a great resource for them too because it can really affect everybody, not just the person who has it. And then are there online communities or support groups for people living with OCD? Yeah, so there are definitely a lot of support groups um, and different online communities. The OCD Instagram community is very active. It's very tight knit. Um, if you follow me at the Octopus on Instagram or even just look at my page and look at my followers, not followers, the people I'm following is probably a better amount. Um, there's so many therapists that give great information online, which is not a substitute for therapy, but it is still good. Um, OCD Peers is a 
Hold on a second, typing it, there we go. OCD peers is a group that runs peer support groups for OCD as well, and they're pretty affordable. So that's another great resource, but the social media communities are pretty lively. And also NoCD has an app where people can talk to each other on that in like a forum way as well. And let's see, do you recommend individual and group therapy? So like I said, I'm not a therapist, so I don't want anyone to take my advice as like the last word. Um, I've done individual therapy. I haven't ever been in a support group for OCD, but a lot of people are in and enjoy it. I would say whatever you can afford is like a good option. But yeah, so there are a lot of different options. Sometimes group th group therapy is more affordable than individual therapy would be. Anyone have any other questions? Seems to be it for the questions in the chat, unless anyone's typing. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your knowledge and all the resources that you found to be helpful with OCD. I think it's so inspiring to turn, you know, something like this into like advocacy work. I love the octopus and the purpose behind it and like what you're doing and how it is different from others. So very exciting. Yeah, no, thank you. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I thought it was so cool that I was sought out to talk about OCD because even that was a really big change. I feel like a lot of times with mental health, people will talk about, either they'll talk about mental health and not mental illness, or they'll talk about anxiety and depression, which is obviously very important too. But OCD doesn't always get its time, I feel like. So it was really, awesome that OPA saw an opportunity to diversify like the mental health experiences too. I thought that was really awesome. Yeah, and I hope this is just the beginning of conversations that we have, especially within the organization. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, <laughs> that we have within the organization um, surrounding mental illness and mental health. So I really appreciate your time. If no one else has any other questions, then I'm happy to end here, but I'm just so grateful for you um, making yourself available and sharing the event with others so that they could be here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who came. I really appreciate it. Let me know if you follow me on social so I can follow you back. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank every thank you everyone for coming tonight. And we have one more mental well-being event that is posted online, which is um, a yoga workshop hosted by Casey, one of our national team members and members. So that's the last event for Mental Health Awareness Month. So I hope you guys will join us for that. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. <laughs>